So our next sort of skin disorder we're going to look at is an ulcer. This is a lesion of the skin or mucous membranes marked by inflammation, necrosis, and sloughing of damaged tissues. So necrosis means basically a condition of dead tissue. And I mentioned the word sloughing before, which is just kind of what our body does to get rid of cells. They sort of just peel off in a way when they're, they have no more useful life. And an ulceration has all of those characteristics. So once again, this is not infection, but there's definitely inflammation involved. And that is an ulcer. Now, a pressure ulcer or a decubitus ulcer is a particular type of ulcer. Um, if any of you work as caregivers or have ever had someone who lived in a skilled nursing facility, something we refer to as a sniff, um, they're not as common as they used to be, thank, thank the Lord. Um, a pressure ulcer is a skin ulceration caused by prolonged exposure, usually in a person who's bedridden. Um, once again, decubitus ulcer or bed sore is another word for it. So those of you who have ever worked with anyone who uh, has the inability to get out of bed, uh, as a, and maybe you've worked as a caregiver or you've worked as an LVN in a care facility, you know that people who can't get out of bed have to be rotated every so often. Every few hours you have to turn them. If you don't, what happens is a pressure ulcer because the pressure of the bone bearing down on the skin against the mattress without any relief for hours and hours causes skin to break down. The worst one of these I'd ever seen uh, looked way worse than the one you see here. It was located in the area that you see the diagram with all the green right in the center of that. And in this case, the ulcer had gone all the way through the skin and the tiny thin, thin layer of muscle tissue and the sacrum, the actual back of the pelvis was exposed. Uh, that person had been left in a bed with wet undergarments for sometimes days, if not weeks at a time, very poor care. And it was a, a tragic thing to see really upset my doctor, and she did treat it successfully, um, but it usually indicates that someone is being mistreated somehow. These occasionally can happen under a cast, if you've ever had a cast on. Um, that might be just a side effect of casting, but they're pretty rare in that situation. Either way, when we see them, they need treatment, and if it's the result of someone lacking care in a facility, you want to report that facility. So if you have a loved one who has something like this as a result of someone not managing their health care, they need to be reported. The particular case I mentioned uh, that upset my doctor, she did report it, and that care facility was uh, put out of business the next week, and patients moved to new facilities because they weren't being taken care of. So that's my two cents on pressure ulcers or decubitus ulcers. We don't want these to happen. We want to avoid them at any cost, and the presence of them usually indicates a lack of proper care. But you always have to ask the questions and do the investigation before you make the accusation. Either way, if you see it, please bring it to someone's attention. If you yourself are the medical provider, then you'll know what attention to give it. Urticaria. This is a nice fancy word for hives, an allergic reaction of the skin. Maybe some of you have food allergies or drug allergies. They almost always manifest themselves as urticaria. There are other forms of manifestation of allergic reactions, and we'll get to those in different chapters. This is the bottom tier one, the most benign type of allergic reaction and probably the most common. So you see, the, see like these raised, itchy, flat welts of skin on this person. Once again, most likely a food, a medication, laundry detergent, cosmetic, could be a form of shower gel or shampoo. You can react to almost anything on the skin. Hives are something that take a while to heal. As a matter of fact, as I said at the beginning of the chapter, it takes about six weeks because that's how long it'll take you to grow a new derm layer. So they will, they will eventually go away, but patience is definitely advised. This word is not misspelled, puritis, and that's the best I'm gonna do on the pronunciation. It is P-R-U-R. It is a word for itching. So you could be a human, you could be a dog, uh, you could be just about any mammal, but if you're itching the skin, you're involved in the act of pruritis, which means you're itching at something, you have some sort of skin irritation. Petechia. These are small round spots in the skin that appear as a result of bleeding from capillary vessels under the skin. Um, so this is not a form of acne. This is a form of a side effect of certain types of, uh, certain types of infections, a skin infection. So petechia can result uh, from, once again, I'm not going to get into the whole cornucopia of conditions. Um, they usually indicate something's going on. If petechia shows up 
and you're not already under treatment for something, your patient's not already being treated, it's kind of come out of nowhere and it has this sort of appearance, it'd be a good idea to seek medical uh, medical uh, care or if you're in that setting to bring it to your doctor's attention because um, there's likely something going on that needs to be addressed. A hematoma is a localized swelling of blood within tissues. This is not the same as a contusion. So a contusion is a word for bruise. A hematoma is exactly as written here. There's two types. Maybe you've gotten what we often refer to as a bruise after getting a blood draw, um, and it looked like the picture here on the left. Or maybe you have fallen and struck your head really hard and damaged the dura mater, which is the inner lining of the, uh, uh, of the meninges, uh, or a, one of the layers of the meninges, rather, which lines the spinal column and wraps around the brain to protect it. Either way, what's happened is the blood vessels have been broken and they're leaking uh, underneath a, a skin layer or a tissue layer. The one on the left looks unpleasant but will heal. The one on the right is potentially deadly. So that one on the right has been a blow to the head and it's damaged the it, it's damaged the uh, the lining around the brain, and it's called a subdural hematoma. And what happens is the blood vessels start leaking into that tissue because the capillary beds have been crushed, and that causes the the tissue to swell and put pressure on the brain, and that is a very serious condition. So anyone who's been struck in the head very hard, if they have abnormally sized pupils, one's larger than the other, slurring of speech, um, inability to stand well or stand at all, nausea, any of those things after a head trauma, immediately to the ER or urgent care, they need to be evaluated to make sure they don't have a subdural hematoma. You know, the best news you can get in those situations is you overreacted, they're just fine. That's what we call good news in medicine. Um, if a hematoma truly is there and it's a subdural hematoma, that's gonna require hospitalization, some surgery and some other things to deal with. So by all means, if anything abnormal appears after a strike to the head and it lasts for any amount of time, more than a minute or two, it's something worth having evaluated. A hemorrhage. Well, what I just described to you is a form of hemorrhage, the subdural hematoma. Um, in this case, though, it's an excessive loss of blood in a short period, externally or internally. So a subdural hematoma, as I mentioned, would be an excessive loss of blood. Although it's staying within the tissue, it's not in the circulatory system and it's causing damage. Another type of hemorrhage might be if you took a, had some sort of stab wound to the abdomen and you could see the blood. That would be an external hemorrhage. Um, given the options, I'll take the external hemorrhage. I can see it and I know I need attention. The internal ones are trickier. They're more ones that require recognizing symptoms of uh, uh, some sort of internal hemorrhage. Either way, um, when we're talking about excessive losses, loss of blood, we want to get medical attention right away. Contusion, I mentioned this earlier. That's a medical term for a bruise. So what you see here is exactly that. This is the picture of someone who hit a steering wheel during a rear end collision. She was the driver that hit the other car and her face came forward and struck the steering wheel. Uh, it's kind of a gruesome look to it. It could have re resulted in a blowout fracture around that right eye. Um, this appears to not be one. So when we see a contusion, especially like this one, we definitely want to get medical attention again. This could refer to a fracture at the base of the cranium, so inside the skull. Um, in this case, it didn't, but that is a common symptom with, with, an, with internal, internal cranial fracture that you'll see that type of bruising around the eye. Um, if someone took a punch to the eye and they, or a, a trauma to the eye and it appears to, to look like this, it's a very good option to go get medical treatment just to make sure there's nothing to be concerned about. Um, but typically, getting back to the word itself, this is our word for a bruise. Blunt force trauma to an area causes swelling of the capillary beds and leaking and a bruise results from it. We have different types of wounds. You're going to need to be familiar with these. An incision is a surgical cut. A laceration is a wound with torn, irregular, and jagged edges. An abrasion is scraping or rubbing away of the skin by friction. Hello, skateboarders. That's usually one of the one of the wounds we see associated with skateboarding. An avulsion is a tearing away of a body structure or part. We see that here in the middle where someone, for some reason or by some mechanism, had the fingernail torn off. I've done it twice. I recommend not doing it. It's really painful. And punctures. These are wounds made by an object that pierces the skin. 
we see the dog in the corner biting on the finger. Um, another form of puncture is getting it, getting an IM injection. So it might be medically indicated to get one. It may not be medically indicated to get one. Either way, if it breaks the skin, it's a puncture. If you come in with a puncture wound, the first thing we're going to ask you is, when did you have your last tetanus shot? Because we want to avoid you getting tetanus. All right, debridement. This is the removal of dead or damaged tissue from a wound. So if you have a bad wound, it's in the healing process. We've bandaged it. We're probably going to ask you to come back, remove the bandage. We're going to scrape away the dead or damaged tissue, the necrotic tissue. We want to get rid of it so that nice, healthy tissue heals. So we're going to scrape that away. We're going to do a debridement, the scraping away of the dead tissue. We're going to rebandage it. We'll tell you to come back in a couple of days. We'll repeat that. And these are usually very severe wounds, severe burns that go very deep, you know, third, fourth, fifth degree burns. They require a lot of debridement. Um, and that's what we do. Take off the bandage, scrape away the dead skin, and put a new bandage on until it's all nice and healthy. A skin graft might be the ultimate result of that. This is a transplant of healthy skin onto an injured site. May be recommended for extensive wounds, burns, certain types of surgeries. Most common skin sites for, uh, sites for skin grafts are the buttocks, inner thighs, which are usually hidden. So those are called harvest sites. They'll come in with a dermatome, they'll harvest the skin, they'll place it over the damaged area. Sort of an illustration, if you Google this or look on YouTube, you can find lots of videos of skin grafts. If you want to see the details of it, I recommend uh, tuning in to YouTube. Here you see the harvest site in the upper left. There's the dermatome. They're shaving the skin off that area, the harvest site, and they're applying it in the lower part. They're grafting it onto what appears to be a burn or a wound on the posterior aspect of that wrist and then it heals. So this is a very much simplified version of how it works. YouTube, as I said, they have a lot of great videos on all kinds of medical procedures. So if you want to go down that road and you don't mind the blood and get some medicine, you can certainly find quite a bit of it on YouTube. Skin graft types, allografts, one person to another. So you might graft skin from one person to another. An autograft would be what we just showed you. That's skin from one part of your body to another part of your body. So it's the same individual. And a xenograft is from a foreign donor to a human. Uh, in this case, they use the illustration of a pig, and that's also called a heterograft. So you're probably wondering, what would we take from a pig and put into a human? Um, heart valves. Believe it or not, we're more closely related to pigs or swine than we are to monkeys. People often think that we, uh, we, and we may have evolved as apes. We don't really know how we got here. We don't know the real story. Um, however, it happens to be that pigs are very intelligent animals and their systems, circulatory metabolic systems, are very, very similar to humans. And so it happens to be that heart valves from pigs can actually be put into human beings and will work. Now, in more common medicine, they are likely to use an artificial heart valve. Uh, but xenografts still do happen. So there's a strange little bit of uh, trivial information for you. Here's our abbreviations. We kind of covered those as we went through. I'm not going to read them off to you. I'll let you take a look at them yourself. So there's page one. And then we have a few more here in page two. As I said, we saw these during the lecture, so maybe you already picked them up. If not, definitely pay attention to them. We will have some of them on this week's exam. So there you are, there's chapter three, our first body system, the integumentary system. Uh, that's everything you'll need to know for the exam next week. And as I like to say, just enough medicine to be dangerous. So go forward, study these words, abbreviations and word parts and all of the stuff we talked about and uh, use this to prepare for your exam this coming week. Thank you for your time and attention. And uh, we'll be back next week with some more exciting medical terminology for you. So stay tuned and I uh, hope you're all doing well. Thank you.